In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I will come back to the gospel uh, towards the tail end of my sermon today, but the, the gospel passage often is viewed as one of the tougher nuts to crack because of the second part of it. And I'm going to attempt to summarize what it probably means in about a minute. It needs to be paired with the first part. And if you read the entire gospel passage from start to finish, a good way of wrapping your head around it is that the woman who approaches Jesus is a perfect example of why your background, where you're from, who you are, doesn't matter. What matters is the faith that comes out of you. The first part is about rituals and things that uh, observant Jews in Jesus' time were doing that had become more important than anything else. And Jesus' point with that is it's not the rituals and the customs you observe. It's the actions that you live out. And part two is with the woman. It's not the background or where you come from or who you are that matters. It's the faith that you have in your heart. I will come back to that because it links, I think, a little bit to the rest of what I'm going to say. Our psalm today is one of my favorites, not only because it's one of the shortest psalms. I'm a really big fan of short psalms for a lot of reasons. But it's a great prayer and song for unity across division. And I want to give you a little bit of Bible study background on probably when it was written and how Bible scholars know these things. If you read through it, there's a couple of key components there. Um, Aaron is Moses' brother. So we know that it was written after Moses and Aaron. And the two mountains, you might not know they're mountains, that are listed in verse 4, Mount Hermon and Mount Zion were, you probably know Mount Zion. Mount Zion is in Jerusalem. It's basically where the Temple Mount is and was. You might not know about Mount Hermon. On a modern map, Mount Hermon would be in the north of Israel and kind of on the border of Lebanon and Syria. If you've read in the news the Golan Heights, that's pretty much where it is. 2,000, 3,000 years ago, it was in the same place. Mountains tend not to move. The geographical lines were a little bit different, but in the time of when Israel was under King David and the monarchy and that sort of thing, the half-tribe, and that's a there's a reason I call it the half-tribe, of Manasseh, which comes out of Joseph. That's where Manasseh, the tribe, was. So on a very quick, you know, timeline of Bible history, you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Jacob's children are what our story in the Old Testament is about. And we read the tale and the reconciliation of Joseph and his brothers. If you want to read the whole thing, it's a great story about family dysfunction, among other things. It starts in chapter 37 of Genesis. Uh, it's a good read because it will put into perspective the dysfunction that we all have in our own families and give us a wonderful example of how in the midst of family dysfunction, even things that may seem unforgivable. And if you know Joseph's story and his brothers, they sold him into slavery. So there were some things that he probably had to work out in order to get back together with them, and he does that. Um, and there's some guilt on their side, too. But it's a great story and worth reading from start to finish. And our psalm is paired up with it. Obviously, how good and pleasant it is when brethren, in this case family, live together in unity. But the psalm wasn't written for that. The Bible history continues onward. So you probably know that Joseph and his brothers are the 12 
that begin to be the 12 tribes. They settle into Egypt. They're there for 400 years or so. Um, they prosper initially and eventually are enslaved by Pharaoh. The story of that is in Exodus. And they leave, led by Moses, across the Red Sea. They spend years wandering. Joshua leads them into the Promised Land. And they eventually get to the point where King Saul and King David unify all of those tribes under one united monarchy. And it looks geographically similar to modern Israel. You may not know the rest of the story all that much. The monarchy breaks in half after King Solomon. And you have two divided countries, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. The people had similar customs. They knew they were one people, but they had a lot of divisions and differences, not just political, but a lot of religious things. Uh, to use the obvious example, if you're in um, northern Israel and Jerusalem and Mount Zion is in southern Judah, you would literally have to cross national lines to go to church, to go to the temple, right? So holy places in the north, often on mountains, became important. And that was a source of significant division that continues into the New Testament. You'll see that anytime you run into Samaritans in the New Testament, um, or you worship on this mountain and we worship on that mountain, a lot of the divisions were a mix of religious and political. And I started off by mentioning these two mountains. Mount Zion was in Judah, in Jerusalem, and Mount Hermon was a holy mountain up north. What the psalm is saying, and it's probably written in this time of division between these two divided peoples that are actually one people, what the psalm is saying is that God blesses the mountain in the north, Hermon, with the same dew and blessings as he does to Mount Zion in Jerusalem. That we are one people, one God. And in that context, it's a prayer for Christian unity. And the link, not Christian unity, uh, it's a prayer for unity among the Jews. Um, and the prayer about Aaron can probably be viewed as a reminder that we, the people of Israel, came out together. And though we have our differences, we pray that we are one. I used to say this all the time, and I've gotten into trouble for it, but does that make sense? Okay. Um, when you get into the gospel passage, again with the Canaanite woman, in Mark's gospel she's referred to as a Syrophoenician Greek woman. It's a different type of division. But Jesus, again, shows that it's your actions and your faith that matter far, far more, in fact, they're the only things that matter, than the religious customs or the political differences or your background or your language or where you come or what you look like. None of those things matter. They form us, they do matter to us, but to God, we are all God's children. Full stop, period. My guess is every single person in this room, I mean, you've lived a good life if you've never had a family squabble or a division or a full-blown family feud. All of us have had these things. Um, if you're lucky, you're not in the middle of one right now. But the odds are pretty good that you've got in your family unit, or extended family unit, some things that you might consider praying over, some divisions, maybe some faults on your own side, maybe some things that were done to you. But I encourage you in your family life to use this psalm as a prayer for division being healed. I also think the context of it which gets into politics and the divisions between one united people that had been divided into two 
in the divided monarchy sounds kind of suspiciously like America today to a degree. It's a good prayer to pray when you're having trouble doing anything other than offering a prayer to heal these divisions. Uh, I'm not trying to whitewash pain and uh, things that divide in any way, shape, or form. But if you cannot at least pray that our divisions are healed in your family, in our nation, in our world, then I'm not sure um, that there's much left that you can do. If your heart doesn't want at least to pray, then you're never going to be able to live out and act in a way that allows you to be an agent of peace and healing and mercy and love. And I think that's really the lesson of today's gospel. That in Jesus' time, just like in ours, how people acted in terms of their customs and their backgrounds and their rituals and where they were from and the languages and their cultures and all of this, their political parties, had often, and this is throughout history, been lifted to a point where they were all that mattered. But that is not the case. What matters most is that we are children of God. And I encourage you, in any divisive situation that you are in, to at least start to pray for divisions to be ended, for yourself to let go of things that you can let go of, for forgiveness to creep in, for prayers for your enemies. This is a good prayer. Take it home with you. Memorize it. Uh, pray it when you have some kind of division. And hope that your heart and your mind begin to move closer to reconciliation. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.